and we uh, make that available to you for sure after the fact if you're interested. So welcome everybody to uh, you know Wellness Innovates, our weekly uh, webinar. We've uh, we started uh, you know this is now our 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 tenth or eleventh webinar. Uh, here we are, uh, almost three months now into this pandemic, and as soon as the uh, webinar. Uh, sorry, as soon as the pandemic began, we really wanted to get in front and offer support and tools to people who are in business, uh, entrepreneurs, and the workplace, and it's been a lot of fun. And so today we're going to talk about suicide in, in COVID, and uh, we're really fortunate to have with us Jared uh, Hinman with us today. Uh, Jared is Vice President of Community Development for Living Works, which is actually the world leader in suicide uh, prevention training solutions. And you know, some folks might be wondering, you know, how come, like, why are you talking about suicide? You know, is, isn't that a little bit depressing? We're already uh, depressed enough. But one of the things that uh, Connie and I and, and Wellness Innovate have been saying since the start is that, you know, the, the, the cure uh, to, the, to the lockdown might be worse uh, than the disease itself of COVID. You know, in other words, this idea that uh, you know, locking people in their homes and, 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 and decreasing sort of social connection and increasing social isolation. Uh, the thought that that can somehow be good for somebody's health is absolutely uh, one of the, the weirdest uh, concepts I've ever heard. Uh, you know, we've kind of said consistently from the start that uh, it's 100% um, possible to be physically distant and yet not socially isolated. And so a lot of experts are talking about the fact that um, the real second wave once the lockdown eases, as it's beginning to right now, and lots of the United States and, and, and uh, almost right across Canada in different stages and in different ways. But uh, you know, the, the real concern is about uh, this idea of a mental health pandemic. And uh, you, know, you might say, well, why? You know, we, we, we shut everything down for a couple of months. Shouldn't it all bounce back? But um, you, know, you can see from the numbers on the screen in the US, uh, this is a staggering number total unemployment claims have risen to 39 million since the middle of March. I, and I mean, you know, so just, just for reference, uh, all of Canada has 37 million people. <laughs> so, so there's more unemployed in the U.S. than every single human in this entire country and, and in Canada. And you might say, well, you know, okay, that's, that's the U.S. What about Canada? Well, in Canada, 7 million people, right? So that Again, we've got about 35, 36 million. So one out of every five people in this country have applied for the CERB, which is the uh, Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and just under 4 million jobs have been lost. And you need to understand uh, that that is massive. I mean, the impact of that. And many of those jobs will never come back. And uh, one of the tragic things about that is, meanwhile, uh, Forbes uh, let us know just the other day that 25 of the wealthiest people in the world since the pandemic started, that their uh, worth has gone up $255 billion. So you need to, you need to kind of understand the, the dynamic here, right? You have the rich getting far richer and uh, those who are middle income, those who are perhaps low income, uh, uh, are, are absolutely experiencing uh, a tragedy. And, and what does this have to do with suicide? Well, you know, the, the uh, Orange County Register, if you can imagine, and this isn't scientific data, but it's, it's good reporting. Uh, you know, some suicide hotlines are reporting increases of 80 times, you know, so uh, over what they're seeing. And, uh, and so, you know, I mean, Connie and I, we are uh, mental health practitioners and in, in our zone, mental health experts, but uh, we thought, Today we would bring in the real expert when it comes to suicide, and and uh, that would be uh, Jared. And Jared has a super interesting background, and so welcome, Jared. We're so happy to have you here today. Hi, Abe and Connie. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. So I'll just throw the first question uh, your way because I think it would be cool for people to understand your your background a little bit about you and a little bit about the work that you're doing with your company and, and, and the folks that you work with. So why don't you just let us know that? Yeah, my pleasure, thanks. So as Abe mentioned, and thanks for the introduction, my name is Jared Heinemann. I work for Living Works, uh, which is an international suicide prevention training organization. If you haven't heard from Living Works, uh, the home office of Living Works is, is in Calgary. And I think that the majority of you are based in Calgary. And Living Works has been in, in Calgary for the last uh, 35 plus years since its inception. 
and it's blossomed into this worldwide leader in the provision of suicide prevention and intervention training. I'm new to Living Works. I've been with Liv my one year anniversary is coming up in June at Living Works. I am the vice president of community development, which is a new role, uh, a new position to Living Works and to me. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Prior to joining Living Works, uh, I'm based in the Denver, Colorado area. So I'm one of uh, quite a handful of remote employees for Living Works. We have a team of eight or so folks that live in the United States. We have a team of eight or 10 folks that are based in Australia. We have a team of two that is based in the greater Toronto area and the majority of the home office staff, of course, is in Calgary. And then we have a network of trainers that are all over the world that numbers more than 6,000, um, which is really cool that, we, that, that Living Works is such an international organization. Prior to joining Living Works, I worked at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for 15 years. 10 of those years, I directed Colorado's Office of Suicide Prevention. So my job was to lead suicide prevention and intervention efforts for the entire state of Colorado. So that, that required working in a bureaucracy, uh, understanding limitations uh, to budgets, being in a field that was underrepresented and underfunded uh, for a variety of different reasons which really helped influence my willingness and hone some skills around being innovative in how you approach a topic that has tons of stigma around it and that people just don't, they're not aware of its impact or its importance. And so it's therefore underfunded and unknown, which to me, I think it's a great opportunity. So I appreciate the invitation to talk to you a little bit about about this work and the perspective that not only I bring to it, but that Living Works brings, brings to the table. Uh, and so Abe, is your preference? I, so I, I put some slides together. I don't even know if I can share my screen. Would it be helpful for me to kind of walk through those? Yeah, be great. And, and, and that just kind of frame it out. And then I think uh, Connie and I can jump in with some questions from time to time. So just at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little toolbar where it says share screen. There you go. And um, you got it right there. Perfect. So excellent. So I'll walk through these. I, you know, I don't need to go through all of these. Um, but I will and I welcome and want you to interrupt. And if so, if this translates into more of a conversation than me just talking at you, that is fantastic. Um, so I'll try to I don't know how well I'll be able to keep my eyes on the chat box. So definitely, Abe and Connie, feel free to just interject, even if I'm in the middle of a sentence. Sound good? Okay, right on. So part of what I did in, in, as, a, as a state employee prior to joining Living Works is I spent a lot of time giving presentations to community members, people who knew very little about suicide prevention. And part of my job was to educate and to make people aware of the importance of suicide as a topic. And I always like to start that conversation from a place of hope. Uh, this is such a dark, topic and it's it's very difficult for many people to talk about either because of personal experience or because of fear of the conversation and the reality what is so hopeful for me about suicide prevention is that it is a preventable form of death we're never going to prevent all suicides but if we do it the right way and if people are equipped with the right skills and resources and services People do not have to die by suicide. There is great hope in that, but there's a lot, a lot of work to do. And so for 15 years now, I have been using this painting to introduce the topic of suicide prevention. This is a painting called The Lovers by an early 20th century surrealist Belgian painter uh, by the name of Rene Magritte. I'm so far from an art connoisseur. Um, but right when I started my work in suicide prevention, I went to New York City with a couple of buddies of mine. One of those buddies is an architect by trade and a photographer by hobby. So he reluctantly drugged myself and our other buddy to a couple of museums in the city. And the Museum of Modern Art had the original of the lovers. And I was drawn to this painting for a variety of reasons. It's kind of haunting. It's mysterious. The colors are incredibly bright and rich. And the original is pretty big. It, it struck me enough that I took note of the name of the painter and the title of the painting. And I got back to Colorado and 
I did a quick Google search and it turns out that when Rene Magritte was 14 years old, his mom died by suicide. And when they pulled her out of the water, her nightgown was wrapped around her face. And so I was just blown away by this because he captured this image uh, in a couple of his famous paintings and one of which I just encountered after I'd started working in suicide prevention. And I think it, it really exemplifies this topic well in a couple of ways. One, this idea that suicide is faceless, that everyone is impacted by suicide in one way or another. And it's not obvious always when somebody's suicidal. It's not like a physical injury where you can see, wow, that dude's arm is broken and he needs to go to the emergency department right now. That's not how it works. So there's the faceless nature of that. It doesn't discriminate by, by age or race or religion or uh, sexual identity um, or socioeconomic status. Suicide impacts all demographics. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it impacts some demographics more than others, but it's really the bottom line is it's it's got broad impact. And I uh, think sorry, um, Gary, there's a quick question here about the name of the painting and the name of the artist again, and uh, I'll just type it in as you're sharing it. Yeah, it's called, the painting is called The Lovers, and the artist is Rene Magritte, M-A-G-R-I-T-T-E. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So one quick question. I mean, what have you noticed? I mean, because you've been working in this field for a long time. And um, have you noticed um, the, the stigmatization reducing at all? Or in your view, is it, is it still as prevalent as ever? Uh, yes and yes. That's not, the best, that's not the best answer. But the reality is I think we're making great progress. And I think there's a very long way to go. The best example I can give of that is I believe that young people are much more open to and privy about the topic of suicide and talking about their mental health and understanding its impact on overall wellness and recognizing when they may need support. Whereas people from you know, many generations on this call or older adults, it's not a topic that they will, they will even consider talking about outside of themselves or potentially their primary care doc. And so there's still some work to do, but I'm hopeful again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other thing I would say about the painting before I, before I, before I transition out, Magritte, Magritte painted the lovers when he was 28. His mom died when he was 14. And what that really strikes me about suicide is, you know, any type of tragic death, particularly when it's someone who's, you know, not an older adult, is that the impact is great. But when someone dies by suicide, the impact is different for the people who are left behind in a couple of different ways. People who are left behind have to deal with things like guilt. They often have to deal with unfortunate things like blame from other people. And one of the things that I've learned from survivors of, of a loved one's suicide death is that they grapple for the rest of their lives with the question of why. Why did, my loved, why did my loved one die? And that's a tough thing to have to deal with. And the reality is, is there's almost never one single answer. It's usually a, com a complexity and a layered uh, reason for answers, which means our response to suicide has to be layered because it's complex and it has to be multifaceted. If you ask me, is there one thing you could do to prevent suicide? My answer is no. You have to take a multifaceted, community-wide approach. And so I think that's an important thing to be thoughtful about as well. Um, and so if, for a couple of moments, it might be helpful. And I don't know, Abe and Connie, if people are familiar with Living Works or if it's helpful for me to walk people, to introduce people to Living Works a little bit. Well, you know, oh, sorry, Connie, go ahead. I was just saying it would be helpful um, just because even until I was introduced to you, Jared, I didn't know a whole lot about Living Works as well. Very good. Yeah. And, and you know, people may be familiar with some of the brand names. Like, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with Safe Talk and I've actually done the assist training uh, a couple of times. And, uh, and I think that these are excellent resources. I've referred countless people to them myself, but, you know, sort of Living Works being the, the entity behind it, they may not make that connection. Okay, awesome, thank you. So that's part of the transformation that Living Works is, under, is undertaking now is to, to shift 
how we present our products as living works products, not just the assist training or safe talk, because we have a, a menu of trainings now. And the, the goal for all of our trainings is to be able to provide a training that fits for everybody. So that's why it's this, there's this layered approach. So living works assist, which is applied suicide intervention and skills training is a two day in depth, comprehensive intervention skills training program. It's the original living works program. It's been around for 35 years. It is a evidence-based best practice suicide intervention training program. What we've learned over the years is that ideally everybody on the planet would take assist. Can't do it. It's, it's two full days. People can't be pulled away for that long. Some people don't want to learn that level of depth of skill but some people need to learn that level of depth of skill. So that's why that's such a great program for us. Uh, then we created Living Works Safe Talk, which is a half day. It's a three and a half to four hour in-person training. Uh, that's really about teaching people how to connect someone who's in need with safety. And so you learn the risk factors and warning signs and you learn basic skills to intervene with individuals in need. Within the last year, probably a little more than a year now, we have launched Living Works Start. Living Works Start is an online interactive training program that teaches people how to tune in to someone who may be having thoughts of suicide and how to take action to keep that individual safe. And again, get them referred to, a, to an individual who can provide that, that deeper level of support. And then we also have Living Work Suicide to Hope, which is specifically for clinicians. And that, that training is really about teaching providers how to walk individuals through the recovery process. If they've had a suicidal crisis or even if they have attempted suicide, that training is really designed to support the recovery process. And so what we call this is our network of safety where we use common language. It's a whole common philosophy, but it's also to generate um, a circle of community members. Let me actually pop to not that slide, but this slide right here. We really believe that there is there is a training that fits everybody's needs. And if I, if if the suicidal individual is the person in the middle of this slide, the best approach, the most comprehensive approach, is that all of the circles of the wheel have trained people surrounding that individual in need. So if I if I'm a part if I'm suicidal and I'm a part of a family who doesn't provide me with support, um, you know I think you know if you're a kid whose family has rejected you or there's substance abuse issues or there's domestic violence issues, that may not be where you're going to get your intervention. But and you, a crisis services may be provide you with support and you seek help there. But if your school or your peers or if you work after school, your coworkers are trained. That just creates more people who are going to be able to catch you or support you and get you to safety and the help that you need. And our vision for our layered training approach. So if I've taken Living Work Start, part of the philosophy of that is I may intervene with this suicidal individual, ask them the right questions and understand that they need help. Hopefully I work in a community or an organization where I can say, let's walk you down the hall or let's connect you with the assist trained individual who can really provide that next level of support. And so that's that wraparound, community wraparound approach that we've built at Living Works that um, I, I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of this organization because of this innovative community-wide approach that we're building. And my role as the, the Vice President of Community Development is to help organizations and communities find meaningful ways to adopt this approach and to adopt and prioritize suicide prevention as a system priority. Which I love is hard it. To I love it. Simple. So, you know, I was at a, I was at a, a talk, a, a symposium about two years ago, and I was one of the panelists. And uh, another panel guest was a, um, a professor at the Haskane School of Business in Organizational Psychology. And, uh, you know, he started talking about the suicide rates among middle-aged men particularly in the United States, you know, he was sort of talking 45 to 64. For whatever reason, he, you know, he said it was white men. And, uh, you know, I think it's all men. But what's going on with, with men and suicide right now? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Abe. That's, so let me just pop to that. 
before I do that, so there are some, there are two really awesome resources about COVID. Okay. And suicide that I just want to point your attention to, and we can talk more about it. I'm happy to come back to this, but these are, these are projections, speculations about the impact of COVID that will have on not only mental health, but on suicide. This one's from JAMA, the Journal of American Medicine by three leading suicidologists in the US that really lays out, here's what we need to be thinking about. It's really important stuff. And just last week, The Lancet did a similar commentary from some international non-US or more of a you know, conglomerate of international suicide prevention experts, experts basically issuing similar recommendations and expectations about the impact that this pandemic will have going forward. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit too. Uh, specifically about men, and let me frame this just, and I apologize for the US data, but this, this study from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was fascinating. What it basically says is that from 1999 to 2016, every single state in the United States saw a significant increase in their suicide rate over that time frame, with the one exception of Nevada, who saw a 1% decrease in that time frame. Now, my neighbors in Nevada shouldn't pat themselves on the back too hard just yet because they have one of the highest suicide rates in the country. Um, but hey, they, 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 it's a winning effort for sure. But the bottom line of this is, all of the great work that we're doing in suicide prevention still has a long way to go because our data currently are going in the wrong direction. Part of the contribution to that is that our suicide deaths, the burden is carried by, by males. So this slide really speaks to the U.S. deaths. And again, these data are a couple of years old, but it's consistent that the trends have not changed. So if you look at just total deaths in the US, and I like to look at the rate, the numbers are, are not quite as significant, but that 13.9 per 100,000 is all suicide deaths in the US in 2016. For males, that number jumps to 21.3. And when you look at males of a working age, and I define working age as those ages 25 to 64, the suicide rate doubles that of the total general population. And if you just look at the percentage of those deaths that are working age males, 51% of all US deaths are working age males. Working age males do not make anywhere close to 51% of the population. So part of the burden is carried there. And so in my role as a public health professional, what, we, what I landed on very quickly was, was that that's somewhere we need to address this issue. And up until about eight or so years ago, there was almost nothing that was specifically designed for working age males related to suicide prevention. And in fact, most suicide prevention messaging and resources and, and programs didn't fit the traditional working age male. And so we were, we were really pushing suicide prevention hard with messages like it's okay to ask for help. So, Talk so, about your feelings. Those so are contradictory to traditional male, you know, kind of roles. So how did we get to a place where the rate among men who are working age, as you describe it, is essentially twice the rate of the average person? Like, you know, WTF, like what, what has gone on here? You know, and I, you know, I, we all appreciate that you're, your one perspective, but certainly I would say yours would be much more informed than mine. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. And, and actually, I, have a, I think I have a slide or two that, that helps explain it. This is not just a suicide issue. So this is, I worked on a project, I co-developed a project called mantherapy.org. And as we did that research, we really dove into the topic. And it's not just suicide. Males have higher rates of lots of problem outcomes. Uh, including what's listed on this screen and what really, you know, gets home for me. And when you think about it, things like violence in general is perpetrated by males. And so it would make sense as well that suicide would be suicide deaths. So we're talking about deaths specifically here is male dominated. So it's something cultural and social at play. 
I think part of it is in how we have constructed maleness uh, for men. So this Daniel Boone quote, I think is so spot on. Um, you know, I was never lost, but I was powerfully bewildered once for three days. That whole notion that men won't stop and ask for help, even for the simplest of things like directions. And, you know, I also want to acknowledge that, oh, this one's just kind of funny too. You know, this, this concept that men are, tend to be one track minded, but it's also very true that we are not just homogeneous. We are not all the same. So the way that I frame conversations around men is the, the traditional, the standard norms around maleness lead to negative outcomes. How we, how we socialize boys to be boys and boys to become men in traditional kind of standard settings result in things like men are far less likely to report depression. The data backs up the assumption. Um, and we have these resistances to asking for help and communicating kind of our feelings and forming group, groups around emotional issues. It's not that men are less likely to be depressed. It's that men are less likely to show up and receive a diagnosis of depression because we have a refusal to go see a professional who can diagnose us. So and, that's part of it. And what impact has, would, would economics or, or sort of, you know, having a job and have on that for, for, for men and women, I guess. Like walking me right through this, Abe. This is fantastic. <laughs> I didn't see your presentation ahead of time. I'm, I'm just genuinely curious because in COVID, right, where, you know, we just saw the stats, so many people have lost their jobs. So then you, you, might, you start thinking, well, what, where are we going with this right now? Yeah, so the COVID is so um, interesting is the wrong word, but the impact has the potential to be so significant because the risk factors uh, that contribute to suicidal ideation or mental health crises are compounded right now. Things like social isolation. Uh, we are actively having to promote social isolation right now, which is the right thing to do, but it will have negative consequences for people who may be living with depression or prone to anxiety or other mental health challenges. Job loss, we know, is a risk factor for suicide. When the unemployment rate goes up, data tells us the suicide rate goes up with us. So that's, that stat that you showed earlier, Abe, that, that should tell us that we should be anticipating a rise in the suicide rate as a result of this. Job loss, other stressors like um, uh, intimate partner problems, the, breaking, the breakup of families, Domestic violence, the anticipation is that domestic violence rates will go up. Child abuse and neglect rates will go up. Those all are risk factors and have an impact on suicide. Substance abuse, I mean, the list is very, very long. And so those, and then just, I'm sorry, Connie, just the general anxiety that comes with COVID-19 ramps all of that up as well. I really appreciate you bringing this up, Jared, because um, in Canada, uh, a study that was released from the uh, University of Calgary. It's called Raising Canada. Um, I love how you're attributing this not just to suicide, but to abuse, to all these different things that we're not talking about. Canada right now in, in the world is number 25 for child safety, which mm. means that we're not talking about a lot of these things. We don't want to admit when we have problems. And I mean, I've never been a man, so I'm just sitting back and listening to this whole man conversation, but, and I have my opinions of, of why and what, but so I appreciate how you're sharing what, uh, what uh, some of the issues are there. Some, there's a ton of, of comments in the chat of what uh, some people are thinking and um, opinions about this, but Honestly, we, we have to start being brave and having these safe places. We hosted a conference on Bell Let's Talk Day here in Canada, and we allowed everyone to speak there about what are they noticing around mental health, which I would attribute this to mental health under that umbrella. And every single person in Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver all said the same thing. We want to know how to support people. We just don't know how. Yeah, that's really interesting, Connie. And so that's where I, I like to always take the conversation. So thanks for doing that. And the reality is, is we have 
some viable solutions and answers. And it's, uh, so Living Works is one of those and intervention training is one of those. And we provide a, an evidence-based solution at that level. There's also that component of working way upstream. So doing, you know, from the public health world, what we call primary prevention. So equipping people with the skills or the tools or the environment that keeps them safe way before a mental illness or a suicidal crisis shows up. So that's things like child abuse and neglect programs. It's programs like economic stability, unemployment resources, housing resources, access to health care. That's suicide prevention. We just don't see the impact of it until much later in life. And so that's, so like teaching young people how to recognize their emotions, uh, things like anger and anxiety and stress, not only knowing how to recognize them, but how to respond to them, how to cope with them. And when necessary, how to recognize that I can't cope with this on my own. It's too much or it's a, it's a disorder that I can't control, I need to get the help that I need. Rather than I'm going to respond to that problem by getting drunk, by doing drugs, by, uh, uh, by doing risky behaviors, by being violent. Those are negative responses to those challenges. We need to teach people positive responses and create the systems where they can access help from people and systems that are equipped to help them. So it's big. It's a very big challenge, but we, we, we kind of know the answers. It's just a matter of implementing them and getting the support to implement them in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. you know? so, and part of that, one of the biggest ones for me is in, in talking, going back to men and males and suicide is we need to be thoughtful about how we reconstruct what quote unquote being a man means. These traditional constructs of maleness that I put on this screen, I don't see any of these necessarily as super negative in general, but they can be very negative in certain circumstances like mental illness or violence or suicide. And so maybe there's, and, and what we did with this man therapy project I mentioned is we, we are trying to redefine maleness by putting some tweaks so what I would say, like with the sturdy oak, that air of toughness, confidence, and self-reliance, from a mental health perspective or a suicide prevention perspective, heck yeah, you need to be a sturdy oak and recognize when you need to man up and get yourself some help or man up and recognize that, wow, I'm drinking too much or I'm way too stressed about work or I have some post-traumatic stress that I actually need some support to deal with. That takes courage. It takes toughness and it certainly takes some self-reliance. And so that's just not how we've defined it historically. And so we have to shift that. And that, that takes a cultural shift to get there. I like the culture. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Yeah, yeah, the cultural shift, it really needs to happen. And I think sometimes, you know, if, I'm not sure, you know, like I said, we have a lot of different people on our, on our webinar and, you know, this big umbrella of the systematic change that needs to happen is just vast. And the work that you're doing, it's so worthy and it's so needed right now. Um, when it comes to like in Canada, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death among, among our young people. Um, I actually have a personal story. Our son was suicidal at age eight. This is very personal to me, very personal. Yeah. And in, when we rescued him, I, if I could use that word, out of suicide, out of anxiety and depression, it was because we changed the environment in our home, which of course <laughs> came right back to here. My husband and I had to get really real about um, what kind of environment we were creating. What would you say to people who have no real maybe desire or maybe even they feel powerless when it comes to the systematic change but what could they do right now? Like everyone's home. This is such an opportunity. And I actually really believe that home is what our young people have been looking for. Um, they, they've been looking for a place of safety, of rest. And to be honest, I think that's what we're all looking for. What would you say to, to people who are home right now with their kids? Um, what kind of bravery would you call them to? What, would, what advice would you give? 
Yeah, I think the, and this is true for me as well. And I've been in this field for a long time and I have three kids at home, one of who doesn't want to be at home right now because she's supposed to be in college. Uh, so having to cope with that type of loss, uh, as a parent, you're like, eh, they'll figure it out. But the reality is no, that's very, very difficult. And so my suggestion would be to, um, to really be present when possible and to engage in difficult conversations. I think, um, you know, the real challenge with that is, is we hope it takes time to have meaningful conversations, right? And we don't always know how to ask the right question. So one, our living works trainings actually teach you how to ask the right questions and you practice asking it. So that's a very simple answer, but then you have to have the you have to be unafraid to ask the hard question. And I, for parents, I equate it to, well, hopefully you talk to your kids about sex. Hopefully you're talking to your kids about drug and alcohol use, um, about keeping yourself safe in new and unknown environments. This is the same conversation. It's like, hey, I've noticed this behavior. I'm worried about you. Have you ever had thoughts of suicide or are you feeling suicidal? That's a really hard question to ask, but it's a question that opens up a lot of possibilities from a conversation standpoint. And then the other piece when we're so isolated is to be aware of the resources that are available outside of our homes, whether that's in telehealth, uh, through your primary care doc, through a crisis center, through your church, through your peer networks. Like don't, fortunately we're in a world where we don't have to be we're physically isolated, but we don't have to be socially isolated. So promote, promote the uh, social connections in unique and new ways, which kids are amazing at, you know, right? They're on Snapchat, Twitter. It's, it's all in their hand at all times. And I will say if anyone in Calgary is listening to, you know, what Jared is saying here in, in Calgary, if your child is suicidal, if they're threatening suicide, if they are, threatening you, if there's any kind of abuse, you need to take them to the children's hospital. That is where you go. And if you're not sure if they should be going there, you call the distress center. That's, that's what we do here um, for, for children and, uh, and teenagers. But um, I know that um, there's so many questions here. I know Chris had asked way back up in the chat, um, you know, how many people are reaching out for help that you, have you noticed? Uh, is there a stat on that? Like, are people asking for help? Yeah, I think the best stat that we have, Abe went through in one of his slides from the Crisis Services Center, seeing the dramatic increase in access to those, serv to those resources. While that's, that's concerning, I also take that as a positive because people are recognizing that's a resource that's available to me and they're having the courage to pick up the phone and make a call. So that means we're doing something right uh, and that's encouraging to me. Now, the problem is, is our, our, those systems may, may start uh, being stretched too thin where people are put on hold or they can't get through. So again, a response has to be, we need to make sure that those systems are equipped to take the calls and spend the time that people need. I know in working with the crisis services uh, call center in Colorado, they spend a lot of time on phone calls with people because it's not just a matter of like, oh, you're suicidal, let's talk for five minutes and you're good to go. That's not what it is. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's probably the best indicator. Um, and what would know. you say to, um, for someone, maybe if somebody comes forward and says, hey, I've been feeling suicidal. I mean, a lot of us freeze. If we've yeah. never been put in that situation before, you know, we don't really know what to say. What, I mean, I don't want to give away all your training, but what's one piece of advice that you would give to us? What's something that we could say or do in that moment? The best thing you can do is take them seriously, not brush that comment off. And then the, the skill that we teach in, in Living Works that I think is so relevant, not just for suicide prevention, but for life in general, is we teach the practice of active listening. Like your job is not to talk the person out of it, your job is quite frankly to be quiet and listen and be empathetic. And you don't have to ask the right questions. You just have to be present and available and willing to support that person. 
So in my old job, I would occasionally get crisis calls. And the first couple of times I got a crisis call, one of them was really bad and I was freaking out. And so I just told the person like, hey, I'm new to this. I'm uncomfortable right now, but I'm gonna help you out. Can I put you on hold for five seconds so I can call my boss in here? And I did, and it was fine. And the person got the help that he needed and I got the support that I needed. And so I think it's just being honest and real. Like it's okay to tell somebody you're scared and nervous, but you, that doesn't mean you're not gonna help them out. You know? Well, and like so many of life's problems, you know, when people feel heard, now they have an opportunity to heal, you know, and, and somehow we, we, you know, one of the biggest dangers I've, I found, and when I took assist training, was somebody expresses any idea around suicide, and then we immediately shuffle them off to an expert, when really what they needed was exactly what you said. They needed to be taken seriously, and then they needed to, to be heard, and not talked out of something, and, uh, and that's why, you know, we would strongly encourage everyone to take the training uh, that uh, this company offers because, you know, it, there's some very practical tools that you can learn about listening and then getting them to the right support. You know, I had a, an interesting situation where uh, a young lady, she was 15, 16, and she, she was shocked by the sort of the, the mechanistic uh, sort of approach when she said, I'm, I'm, I, you know, kind of offhandedly, well, I, I, I might want to end my life. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, the police were at her door and, and then they got, she got shuffled off to the hospital and, and it scared her because uh, I think she, she really just wanted to be heard. And, and that's a tough judgment call to make. I mean, yeah, call 911. If you got to call 911, of course, but, but I love what you're saying. Take them seriously. And first, just, just sit and listen with them and understand. One thing that comes up all the time, particularly with young people, is like, well, they're just doing that to get attention. Right? Yeah. They say that all the time. My response always to that is, doesn't matter. That yeah. is an unhealthy way yeah. to seek attention. So there's something at the root of that. So every time I would say, wow, let me stop you right there. Uh, what you just said concerned me. Let's talk about it. Yes. You know? and, and the reality is if somebody's not suicidal, awesome. Yeah. They still may have something else going on that you can help them with by listening. Yeah. And they now see you as somebody that they can approach with a difficult situation. So that's, so I think there's meaning in that. Maybe you, you mentioned the skills that our trainings teach and living work start is such a great access point to these skills because you can complete living work start in 60 to 90 minutes. And right now, because of COVID-19, it only costs $20. So, I mean, you could go right now and be, be pretty equipped in 90 minutes from now. And so that, I, it's part of why I joined Living Works, because I think Living Works Start has such great potential, not only for communities, but for organizations and for individuals to learn these skills in a really accessible, simple, relatively inexpensive way. And what's fascinating about Living Works Start is that it's interactive. It's, and that's hard to do online. So, I love it. And, and so that's livingworks.net and they can pick, folks can pick that up there. I mean, $28, that's like a week's supply of Starbucks, right? I mean, come on, you know, I mean. US dollar amount, sorry about that. Well, you know how all right, a week and a half then in Canada, you know, but uh, I mean, you know, not only are you gonna learn uh, about suicide, but genuinely better relational skills. And that will carry you far in life as well, right? Someone in the chat posted that uh, uh, it's Randy that that it's suicide isn't really a mental health issue; it's a human issue. And I loved how you framed that, Randy, just because it is a human thing, and to take a human seriously, and to know how. I feel like a lot of our our social problems with mental health, suicide are because we've forgotten what it's like to be human and to be in relationship in a way that creates health and wellness for one another. Hey, Connie, that's my colleague, Randy Thompson, who made that comment, so thanks, Randy. Well, Randy, you're amazing. <laughs> thanks, Randy. So, so this is, but it's so true, isn't it? And uh, when you think about it, you know, we have this idea that counselors and therapists, oh, they're the experts, but you know, it, it's, it's not really, cause I was, I was a counselor for 12 years and it's not your area of expertise by any means. And without a doubt, uh, you know, this is uh, critical. So, so one quick, quick question for you then, um, you know, Jared, I know we don't have a lot of time left, 
you know, a lot of our, our listeners are, are business owners, they're leaders, they're entrepreneurs, they're executives. And so what advice could you give them? I mean, in, in terms of what are some in-house solutions? Because people spend, you know, 50% of their, their waking hours on the job. And, and I, I th I'm not going to say we have a legal obligation, but as a minimum, a moral obligation, you know, to, to be supportive to our people. And uh, what, what could you offer them uh, in terms of some steps? So there's, there's um, I'll start with what may be interpreted as the, ins the uh, lack of sensitivity response, but the true response is important to your bottom line. You don't want people showing up to work who are in the throes of a crisis or who are depressed or anxious or hungover. Uh, people show up better if they're well. Uh, so that's, that's cut and dry. The other thing that I think is really important to consider that in my interactions with organizations is that we think about too often suicide in particular, but also mental illness as a private personal issue, which it is, well, maybe the personal part, but not the private part. Um, it's, this is a, a place where people spend so much of their time. <clears throat> and as an organization, I think most organizations are really cognizant of two things, safety and physical wellness. Uh, and, and I think safety is an issue for the construction site or the oil field. It's also an issue for the office. I know I worked in an office for 15 years and you know what I had to do once a quarter? Take cybersecurity training. So I encourage organizations to think of this as a component of safety training. Or, you know, you require your employees to take sexual harassment training. We require students entering college to take um, binge drinking related training. That's how you change a system. You incorporate it into your standard of practice because you care about your employees enough. And you, quite frankly, you care about your bottom line. That this not only should be a one-time thing, this should be part of how you onboard people and how on an ongoing basis you, you take care of people because the data tells us that the workplace has to be a place that we do suicide prevention because there's no other place to reach working age men because you know what? They don't show up at the mental health clinic. Yeah. Uh, and so they die. They die before they show up at the mental health clinic. And so we need other points of contact with them. And so that's why the workplace is so important. Also, churches are important. Community centers are important. The military is important. Schools are important. And workplaces are important. Love it. It's so good. Yeah, workplace. Uh, Abe and I have been sharing the message that if you change the workplace, you really do change the world. And any culture creators out there, anyone wanting to, to make a mark on the way society works, that is where you start. You start in the workplace because you're right, it trickles down. You literally are saving lives by being a responsible employer and creating that culture, putting those systems in place. You're, you're preventing um, the things that we all want out of our out of our culture like suicide like mental illness you become an advocate you become a warrior if i could even use that word you become a, a culture rebel in our world that that literally shifts culture i mean i i want people to hear that jared what you just said it's powerful and it's so so true and it's critical and and honestly this is where the rubber hits the road and then it trickles into our families and then it affects schools and it affects every part of our lives when we start with the workplace. So no, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And I think Randy's comment about us being human resonates, you know, I've had this conversation very recently. Well, this training isn't really uh, designed for my construction workers. I'm like, well, your construction workers are humans. They have kids, they have parents, they have siblings, they have friends. They show up outside of work. And if work can provide them and equip them with that, not, on, not only is it impactful to the organization's bottom line, it's impactful for retention and employee satisfaction. And all of those things are impo important to supervisors and owners of companies. Yeah, without a doubt. So, you know, kind of moving forward, COVID-19, suicide, mental health, you know, just, just speak to us. What are your thoughts on that? And I know that's, that's pretty broad, but you know, this is where it's coming to now, where, where people are, are starting to see as the data comes out that, you know, the physical threat here isn't maybe as bad as we were initially led to believe. I mean, you know, 
the data is emerging every day, so that could change in a month. But but we're 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 clearly seeing some of the signs of uh, domestic violence has, has already started to go up. Uh, obviously, calls to suicide lines, which, like you said, is great, so that we can know and support. You know what 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 do we need to do here, and and what is happening? Do you think? Yeah. So I mean, my gut reac reaction is that, and my guess is that it's going to be rough. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So that shouldn't. Uh, uh, spur us to inaction, it should motivate us to take action right now. Because if we wait until the, you know, the full blown crisis hits, it's too late. Uh, and so we should have been doing it already and a lot of places and people have, but now's the time to act. Uh, at the same time that you're thinking about, well, how do I make this workplace safe? And geez, how do we keep people away from each other and keep things sanitized? How do we also recognize that people are showing up to work anxious and stressed and worried about their job and worried about their bills and uh, having some skills to, to cope and to manage is really, really important. And one of those really important skills, unfortunately, we know is going to be suicide prevention and intervention skills. And so it's, it's really, really important. And I just, I hope that people are thinking and talking about it, not just people as organizations, but politicians, people who write bills, people who cut the checks for tax dollars or for corporate um, philanthropic dollars, things like that. This is an important topic to be thinking about right now. To at least be prepared for the tide and potentially to stem it a bit because the reality is, regardless of the, your circumstances, moments of crisis tend to be relatively short-lived. So if, if, if I'm a person who's in acute suicidal crisis, and Connie recognizes it and intervenes with me and just talks me through and gets me to a place where I'm safe. And then if necessary, can transition me to more professional help. That might be all it takes to save my life because that one suicidal thought, you know, may have trickled along for, for a long time, but that one intervention is what keeps me from ever dying by suicide. And there's, there's research and studies that prove that. But that's fascinating stuff. And so it's, I think sometimes people just fear like, I, there's nothing I can do about this. If somebody wants to die, they're going to die. I can't spend 24 hours a day with them. And the answer to that is that's, that is wrong. That is so, not we talked, so we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of culture of, of men and, and we don't, you know, I mean, I'm a man, I've been a man as long as I can remember. And, and, uh, you, you know, especially if a man grew up without a, a father who would have modeled empathy and open communication well, of course, the man is going to do that uh, himself, but but all, we're also seeing the same challenge with other cultures. You know, um, you know, I happen to be married to uh, a, a beautiful Asian woman, and we've been happily married now for almost ten years. And uh, you know, the culture around mental health and and things like suicide in in different cultures, it's it's not like it's just men. It's also other cultures who struggle to talk about this. So what kind of advice could you offer? Because I think, I think, you know, there's a lot, we have, you know, very diverse audience, uh, similar to the US. And uh, I think a lot of people say, man, my, my culture hasn't supported open dialogue about this stuff. What can I do? What do you yeah. think? I think you really have to find ways to make the messages fit your cultural needs. So my background is in, in making the message fit for the working age male population that really embraces traditional definitions of masculinity, do the same thing with, with a culture that is resistant. I think there's some really amazing work going on, for example, in the Native American population um, is one good example that's very hard hit, not only by COVID in some places, but by suicide deaths, particularly among adolescents. Yeah. So you have to understand, recognize, acknowledge, and, and deal with or come up with strategies to deal with the historical trauma, with the social and cultural issues that say you don't ask for help. Help may not actually be available, so you have to come up with different techniques to provide people the support they need. And you have to recognize the other things that contribute to suicide, not just suicide specifically. And so, you know, like cultures where you just don't talk about private things. Well, we have to find different ways to talk about it then so that people can find places to open up or to intervene or to ask for help for themselves, you know? And that's, that's a difficult task, but it's really important. I think that applies to even another question that, that has been asked about what do you do when, 
you know, there's, there's people in your workplace that have their ideas about <laughs> suicide or mental illness. They have a fixed idea and it's hard to overcome that barrier with them. Yeah, that's an awesome question, Connie. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you, that's what the living works approach is all about. So for an organization, we know that there are going to be that attitude will persist among some people. But if most of the people in the organization are open to it and are willing to have the conversations and they're trained at various levels, hopefully that'll start to shift that cultural belief. And maybe, you know, some people may not come along for the ride and they may stay resistant, but some people will start to see that, oh, this is actually meaningful. It's impacting. If it's not impacting me directly, other people in my organization are being impacted. So that's what I'd say. Don't just train your human resources department. Don't just train if you are an organization that has mental health staff. Train them for sure, but make sure you train the managers and you train the team leads and you train part of the staff so that, again, you create that network of safety. So if one person's like, eh, that's, we shouldn't be doing this, that's none of my business, none of the organization's business, they kind of get drowned out, quite honestly. That's great. That's insensitive, but I, it's what I believe in. <laughs> well, we could, uh, I'm sure we could talk to you, Jared, for, for a couple more hours, I, I, I know, but uh, just, just given that we only have a couple of minutes less, what, what are a few uh, sort of last minute pointers um, that you want to share with us here today? Yeah, I think the bottom line, if, if this topic is new to you or you're unfamiliar or uncomfortable with it, that's normal. Um, but the, mess the message is, is you, someone who's never heard or thought about suicide prevention in a very short amount of time, can, can equip yourself to have the conversation. And you actually can save a life. I mean, that's what's super cool about it. Because all it takes is asking a simple question, being a good listener and being present. And it's a lot deeper than that, as you know, Abe, from taking the assist training, but you can learn basic skills to keep somebody safe. And that's, it's really important. And if you have an, or an organizational leader or a company leader, you can talk about this and embrace it in a way that is supportive of your employees and your organization. And my organization, that's our job is to help you walk that path. And so that's, to me, that's really exciting. So good. So good. And so, uh, you know, definitely we've put in the chat uh, window about uh, going to livingworks.net and uh, looking up the, the online course. Actually, we put the, the actual URL so people can just click on the link. Uh, $28 US, which is uh, 3.4 billion Canadian dollars. But uh, just joking, it's, uh, it's, it's probably right around $40 Canadian. And so, uh, Abe, it's 20 US, so I think, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a website open in front of me, but whatever it is on the website is showing up for you in Canadian dollars. I oh, so it's 20 US. Oh, okay, so that's, that's 28 Canadian, so that's even better. So, hey, I mean, you know, 60 to 90 minutes and, and you can change the game, not only for yourself, but for the people that you love and the people that you're around. Um, so, you know, you know and, and definitely, folks, we will be uh, posting this uh, webinar uh, on YouTube. Uh, so you can go to Wellness Innovate uh, on YouTube and uh, just search it and we'll probably have it up by the end of today, uh, you know, without a doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got uh, so much, uh, you know, respect for you, Jared, and the work of your organization. So any final thoughts, uh, Connie, or comments? I've just thought this was brilliant, Jared. You know, we just want to really validate and just encourage you you know your your line of work is more needed than ever and we are just big fans and we're thrilled that we could spend this hour with you thanks it was a great pleasure i really appreciate the opportunity thanks for prioritizing it and, and giving me this space and the topic the space more importantly yeah folks and, and you know just as we conclude we just want to say thank you for taking time to tune in i mean if you if you're watching this on facebook live or on youtube or uh, on the on webinar itself, we, we, we know that you would only take time to watch this because you care. And, uh, you know, our, our only concern or plea would be to follow up that care by, by you know, clicking on that link and going ahead and, and, you know, we're not financially benefiting at all. But the idea is to put more tools in your hands uh, so that you can help other people. And uh, again, I mean, Wellness Innovate, our focus is broad, more uh, broader than, than just suicide. But, but I'm telling you, 
suicide in my uh, two decades as a, a executive in many organizations has come up over and over and over again, over and over again. And, uh, and so, you know, if you're a manager or you're, you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking, is this relevant to me? It is relevant to you. And, uh, and so please uh, reach out and let's stay connected. And, you know, without a doubt, uh, tune in uh, next week because we have a very special guest for you next week here uh, on the webinar. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we'll see you later.